Well, as, as always, being in this house, everybody's got to preach on them. I mean, when you, when you hear these worshipers begin to share, there's such combustive anointing on them. The air just absolutely becomes alive with the presence of God. And then this wonderful prophetic word. And, you know, I want to thank you, sister, for not backing down, even though everybody was shaking hands around you, <laughs> that you just said, no, I'm going to give what's on me. And wow, what a confirmation. How many of you understand that if we left right now, we already got something. We've already gotten something from God. Hallelujah. Now, tonight, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you from the depth of my heart, values of my life that I feel have made a huge difference in the years that I've served the Lord. I met Jesus when I was five years old. I often, you know, talk about the fact that I have this amazing testimony. Uh, I was all strung out on um, M and M's. <laughs> I was popping reds, blacks, blues, and um, you know, drinking about a fifth of Kool Aid every week. <laughs> and then Jesus delivered me when I was five years old. Um, I got saved after an inspiring message in children's church called Barney's Barrel. That was a story of a little poor boy that was homeless and he lived in a barrel and he came to church and got saved and it just broke my heart that Sunday morning. And I gave my life to Jesus. But at five years old, I got so filled with the power of the Holy Ghost that for an hour and a half, I was lost in the spirit as the Spirit of God moved in my life just as a child. And looking back on my life, which was, that was 65 years ago, I can tell you that I've learned a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. Some of you have seen that commercial. Well, I am that commercial. Uh, I, I would have to be deaf and blind not to have learned something in 65 years of walking with the Lord. You know, I, I believe with everything in my heart that what I'm going to share with you tonight is vital for you. And I believe it's vital for your future. And I believe it's vital for the body of Christ at large. I, I want to share with you on the subject of the blessing of the house. But I want to personalize it. I want to say the blessing of this house. And I want to get even closer by saying the blessing of your house. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you'll speak to us and I pray that this will be a time of transformation in our lives. I ask, oh God, that the Holy Spirit will inspire me to say exactly what needs to be said to fit into where this congregation is and where you have surely ordained that they are going. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask that you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Now, if you were to describe Psalm 84 in just one sentence, it would be this. Psalm 84 is the psalm of the pouring out of love for God's house. It's the psalm of the pouring out of love for God's house. This psalm is written by the sons of Korah. How many of you have that in your Bible right up top of this chapter? It was written by the sons of Korah. What a lot of people don't know is that the Psalms was written over a thousand year period. Some of them were written during the time of Moses. Others were written during the time of Babylonian captivity. 
And then a whole lot of the Psalms were written by David. And some people think he wrote the whole thing. He really didn't. And this chapter is written by the sons of Korah. Now, there are several Korahs in the Bible if you start trying to find out who he is. He's not the first two that appear. He's the third Korah that appears, and he appears during the administration of Moses. Now, Korah was one of the men that Moses trusted to lead the people. He would have been like a staff guy. He was of the tribe of Levi, which meant that he had responsibilities and privileges in the temple or in the tabernacle at that time, I should say. And yet there was a time that Korah became very, very dissatisfied with the way Moses was running things. And he began to gather some men unto himself from several of the other tribes, perhaps all of them. And he began to espouse a different doctrine than the one that God had passed down through Moses and Aaron. And that doctrine was this. The Levites shouldn't be the only ones that can serve in the tabernacle. All of us are represented in the tabernacle before God, so all of us should be able to minister in the tabernacle. It sounds like good preaching. It sounds logical. In fact, it's very democratic. There was just one problem. It wasn't what God had instructed to be done. And so Korah found himself not only opposing Moses' leadership, but opposing God as well. He had the numbers with him, by the way. The strongest leaders of the camp stood with Korah. Well, as soon as Korah began to make his case publicly as hundreds of thousands of these Israelites were watching and listening, Moses was overwhelmed as Korah began to speak. The fear of the Lord hit him and he fell on his face and he began to cry out for mercy because he knew what was coming. Sure enough, Moses stood with instructions straight from the throne. God said, this is what I want you to do. You have every tribe bring the staff that represents their tribe. Every tribe had a staff. It was a stick, but it was a stick that would identify them and their tribe. Dan had a staff. Naphtali had a staff. Judah had a staff. And Levi, of course, had a staff. Aaron. And so when he instructed these men, he said, I want you to tell them to bring the staffs and to put them in the Holy of Holies, lay them before the Ark of the Covenant. And tomorrow morning, the staff that has sprouted leaves, that has shown growth. Now, these were just dead sticks is the tribe that I have chosen. So sure enough, the next morning, they went in and it was exactly as God had said in the beginning. It was only Aaron's staff, the Levitical staff that was blooming. And at that point, Moses asked Korah and all of the men that had rebelled with him and had stood against him and against the plan of God to stand apart from the people, and he commanded all of the other people to remove themselves from them. And one of the most fierce, awesome, terrible sights in all of the Old Testament happened in this moment because God caused the earth to open up and to swallow those families. But yet, Korah had descendants. And when you hear in the Old Testament, the sons of, sometimes that means sons of, sometimes that means descendants of. It is very, very possible that these men were descendants of Korah, not his immediate family. But we know that some of his descendants survived because these men wrote this psalm. Now, let me tell you about these men. 
they not only went on with a great spirit and a great understanding of the truth of God's worship and of God's house, but they became servants in the house of God for all of their lineage. In fact, they actually made up a very significant branch from the tribe of, Is, of Levi called the Kohathites. And these were the doorkeepers in the house of the Lord. And they were also very gifted worshipers. And so here are these men who wrote about the house of God. The same house, the same tabernacle where their ancestors had been judged. The same place that had held such fear and such awe. But now, you can read Psalm 84 and you will never in all of the word of God read such a tender, powerful, passionate outpouring of love for the house of God. And so we're going to go through part of this chapter. We won't get through it all because of time, but I want you just to follow along with me and let's right now discover a new love for the house of God. Here's what the word says. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. The very first thing I want you to consider tonight is this. There is a longing in every man and woman for a place of fulfillment. There is a longing in every man and woman for a place of fulfillment. Now, because we are a democratic society, we are kind of like Korah sometimes. We want to make it up as we go, and we think that God sanctions it. For instance, I have a friend who considers himself to be a spiritual seer. He has nothing to do with the corporate church of Jesus Christ. And when we talk, his excuse is the church is not a building. And he's right. The church is not a building. But make no mistake about it, the church is a gathering. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just make something clear to you. Jesus isn't coming back for you as an individual. He's coming back for a bride. He never says anything else. He's coming back for a church that is unified and together. You know, you could go all the way back to Moses' time when the Lord had put together his first church, the Israelites. And Moses got so discouraged that he went to the Lord and he began to complain about these rebellious, stiff-necked people that wouldn't listen to anything. And God said this, Moses, step aside. I will destroy them. But do you know what he said next? And I'll give you another people. Because people, the people of God, the nation of God, the church of the living God has always been God's point. And Moses was going to be rid of the rebels, but he was surely going to have a people. Solomon, a lot of people think that Solomon asked for wisdom. He didn't. That's not the key thing he asked for, wisdom. There have been books written, the wisest man who ever lived. It wasn't even about his wisdom. In fact, his preoccupation with the wisdom thing was his downfall. Because that's not the way it started. God said to him, what can I do for you? Riches, fame, power, glory. What do you want? I'll give it all to you because of my servant David. 
Solomon responded so humbly. And this is what he said. Go back and read it for yourself. He said, the thing that I ask for, oh God, is that you give me wisdom so that I may lead this great people of yours. That's what got God's heart. That's the thing that God honored, not the asking for wisdom. The Bible says, knowledge puffeth up. God wasn't going to just give him wisdom. That wasn't the thing that moved God. The thing that has always moved God was somebody that would be committed to his corporate church, to his people. And when, Moses, when Solomon said, give me wisdom so that I may be able to lead this great people of yours. And then God responded. Read it for yourself. He said, because you have not asked for riches and fame and glory and power and honor, because you have asked for wisdom that you might lead my people, I am going to do this and this and this for you. And he made him the greatest man on the planet because he shared something with God. And that was the love of the corporate people of God. Jesus was about to be taken from the planet. He had one last prayer that would be recorded. We call it his high priestly prayer. But I think sometimes what we miss in a high priestly prayer is that this is a prayer about the church. It's about the people of God because Jesus prayed this prayer. He said, Father, I pray not just for those that you have given me, but for those that will come after them. It was always his plan to have a church. He said, I pray that you will make them one, even as we are one, I and you and you and me. Lord, I pray that they will be one in us and they will be joined to each other. Lord, make them one. And then there was Peter. You know, there's just always something missing, wasn't there? Honestly. He just couldn't get it right. And the reason he couldn't get it right is because it always came back to him. And let me just say something to you, ladies and gentlemen. You will not be measured by just how well you prayed privately or how well you behaved privately or by how intimate you were in your closet, you are going to be measured about how much you loved the gathering. Jesus was resurrected. He had revealed himself to everybody. <laughs> Two guys that are walking on the road to Emmaus totally blows their mind, <laughs> sits down to eat with them. The resurrected Lord, by the way, conqueror of death, hell, and the grave, taking time for a stroll. <laughs> it was all right because, you know, he had 40 days. He was going to hang around a while. So he just walked home with these guys, went in, and then blessed the food and disappeared and they looked at each other. And, you know, this is the way people are. You know, when something great happens, there's always somebody that says, ah, I knew it. <laughs> and they looked at each other and went, ah, I knew it. Didn't our hearts burn within us? And the word of God says that those two men got up and they went back to the others. Then... Jesus appeared to John. He appeared to uh, Mary Magdalene. He uh, walked right through a wall and called Thomas's bluff. But there was one guy he hadn't talked to yet. He saved him for last. That was the self-centered one. 
the guy that was going to be the rock upon which the church is going to be built. You see, that went right over his head. Jesus didn't say, you're going to be a rock and nobody will be as strong as you. He said, no. He said, you're going to be a rock, a foundation stone for my people, for the church. The church will model your faith. People will need you, draw on you, emulate you. How many of you are with me tonight? And so Jesus sent word through the women. Man, I'm going to tell you, it's amazing to work with godly women in the church of Jesus Christ. I don't know why it is, but they get twice as much done as the men. It's, it's, it's amazing. I, I had a leader of my school leave, and I was you know, a little disturbed about that. And I, I went to Bogota, Colombia with my prophet friend, Gustavo Paez, and he's a wonderful prophet of God. As soon as I walked into Gustavo Paez's house, he said, Pastor Denny, come, come. And I walked back into his kitchen. We sat down, and they were cooking something wonderful, so I was incredibly distracted. And he said, I have a word for you. Of course, he knew nothing about what was going on at my school. He said, there is a man who is about to leave you. And he said, it's an important person, and he has been a businessman. And this man had come from the corporate world to me. And then he looked at me, and he said, his name is Jerry. And of course, he didn't know Jerry from Adam. I said, okay. You've got my attention. He said, you think it's a bad thing that he's leaving, but it's a good thing. He said, God is about to do more in your ministry than ever before. He said, now that you are back, the Lord says this to you. Now that you have moved back into the place he wants you, he is about to reinvest in his company. And then he said this, he is sending a band of strong women to work with you. And then he named them. And those women are working with me till this day. You see, the fact is, I discovered something. When God can't get it done through a man, he'll just choose a woman. Amen. Now I hope you ladies are going to pray special for me after that. Because I'm not stretching the truth here. The women said to Peter, go and meet Jesus in Galilee. He said he is going before you. So Peter and John went to the place they always hung out. They uh, were outdoorsmen. I, I'm not an outdoorsman. Let me just say this to you. There is nothing about sleeping in a tent that has ever appealed to me. There is never, I, I want to say this in Cajun land. I have never one day in my life woken up and said, man, I'd like to go shoot something. I don't even fish because I can't take them off the hook. Now, let me tell you this, to this very day, I can knock that boy's hat with the cross. I can knock his hat off with the football from right here. So don't tell me I'm not a man. <laughs> but here's the truth. The disciples were just like you, Sha. <laughs> they liked the outdoors. They liked to... Fish. They, they slept under the canopy of the stars. Oh, God, that's terrifying. <laughs> Jesus told the women, tell them our place. And sure enough, Peter and John went there. Peter and John went there, and he wasn't there yet. So they just said, well, let's just go fish, you know. 
So they got in their boat and went out fishing away from the campsite where the disciples normally hung out. Their duck camp. And then suddenly there was a silhouette of a man on the shore and he calls out over the drink. He says, are you catching anything? Now you remember the very first time that Peter met Jesus. Jesus got in his boat and told him to let down his nets. And and Peter didn't want to do it because he just cleaned those nets and he hadn't caught anything. And he said, put them on this side of the boat. And he wasn't able to pull the fish. And Peter turned to Jesus and said, depart from me because I'm unclean. In other words, the glory and the holiness of that supernatural visitation totally leveled Peter. And now here they are post-resurrection, but Peter hasn't seen him yet. And he hasn't seen him since he denied him three times. There were mixed emotions here. Yeah, I want to see him, but not so much. Sure enough, this man, this silhouette in the early morning hour calls out across the deep. Are you catching anything? They call back. No. They're not biting. And the man says, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. Boy, that was familiar. And without hesitation, they threw their nets on the other side of the boat. And they could not pull the fish in. And John, according to scripture, stood straight up in the boat and said, I know who that is. Peter knew he was here. And all of his, amp- all of his apprehension evaporated in that moment and he jumped into the water and swam to shore and by the time he got to shore well John had already grabbed the oars and was close to landing the boat and he said to both of them come on guys come on over here I built a fire Fried fish and hush puppies, just like old times. <laughs> and that night they talked. He called him over for his private moment. And he said, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. May I paraphrase? Because I believe I have a revelation here. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I do, Lord. Then love my people. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then love the gathering. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you then understand it will never be about you. That if you represent me, you will represent me by loving my church. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this to you. I have grown up in the Pentecostal charismatic world. I have seen everything twice. I am prophetic. I operate in it. I value it. I run with prophets that are so scary, you probably don't want to meet them. But I will tell you this. I have seen more quacks and charlatans and fakes in the body of Christ. And they all have one thing in common. They love themselves, but they do not love the Lord's church. There is a longing in every man and woman. 
for a place of fulfillment. Notice the language here written all the way back thousands of years ago. This is how it translates through the centuries, through the millenniums. It comes to us in language that could be recognized by every student of theology, by every student of philosophy. It says, my soul longs. The soul, the soul is that part of us that seeks fulfillment, that seeks to be honored, that seeks to be loved, that seeks an experience in life that will bring you the emotion of happiness, that will elicit all of the bells and whistles of life that everybody is looking for. It's the soul that cries out for something good to happen in your life as you sit in this Wednesday night service. It's the soul that longs for a place that you can call home and a place of fulfillment. When somebody is scarred deeply, when they are used and abused, we often talk about soul ties. It's talking about a soul that seems to be hopelessly fettered to an experience of the past that they cannot rid themselves of. Here, these riders, these sons of Korah, these worshipers say it for us. It is only in the corporate place of worship that I find a place that my soul cries for. You see what has happened to us over the last couple of years is that we saw government intervene and tell us we could not meet. You say, yeah, but we got the word over the line. Folks, please, 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 please. Do not buy that lie. The church is not about information. It never will be. It will never be just about hearing worship over line. And you know, there are those that have taken the cue. They've understood that they can watch hill songs and they got better music than all of us pulled together. And they can listen to four or five preachers and I'm getting more church than I ever got. No, you're not. You're not getting any. Because church is never about the information, folks. And if you believe that, you've missed it. Church is about community. Have you ever considered the law and why it was given? Oh, thank God, I'm not under the law. You're under some of it. You don't think you're under the law? Sir, just go out and commit a little adultery and see if your wife is okay with that. I'm telling you. Just lie to your small group leader. See if he thinks you're making progress. Bear false witness against somebody. How about getting you a couple of little idols and putting them in your house? Oh, you're under, you're under some law. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that you have the power of the grace of God? You see, what we talk about in this generation is this. We talk about the grace that exempts instead of the grace that empowers. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pastor, but even the Apostle Paul, he had a thorn in the flesh. Yeah, and what did Jesus, what did the Lord say about that? I mean, well, he said, he, he asked him three times to take it away. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. So everybody's got a thorn in the flesh. That's not what that scripture says. 
That scripture says he asked God to take it away from him three times. And God said, I have put the power in you to overcome that. I'm not giving you any more. What you have is enough for you to overcome the thorn. Our souls should long for this place. You shouldn't be at home on Sunday. Ah, honey, let's just watch it on TV. Come on, let's get some popcorn. Let's just get in here and buy the TV and we'll pray together and we'll just, we'll just watch it on TV. No, no, your soul should be saying, I got to get there. God, you got to get me there some way or another. I got to get to the house of God. I have got to get there. My soul, that's the place my soul is fit because there is something elevated even beyond my normal personal prayer life when I get with those that God loves. And don't you ever, 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 don't you ever, 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 ever buy the antichrist lie that you don't need to go to church because people are so flawed and they're so two-faced and they're so hypocritical. That's exactly where you need to be because you're fighting all those things yourself. But at the same time, listen to me, listen to me. Those are the people that make up the Lord's church. That's all of us. And we get to be imperfect together. And still we are righteous because of the blood while we are being made holy. The law, let me tell you about the law. It's not even necessary if God didn't plan to have a people. You wouldn't have needed it. Because everything you do to break the law has to do with somebody else. You know what those laws are? They're how to settle boundary disputes because the Lord expected us to live by each other and to know each other. It's what to do when somebody loses their John Deere and you're the cause of it. You ran it in the ditch. In those days, it was called a donkey. Right. Because God expected us to be kind to one another. He expected us to be together, that whatever we did, we did together. So we were going to need all these laws because he expected it. And then Jesus comes to the Sermon on the Mount. And he begins right away about talking about happiness. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those that mourn. Every virtue that he gives is observable and definable only from a corporate setting. You don't decide if you're those things yourself. Others get to make that decision. You don't get to decide if you're humble. Donna gets to decide that. <laughs> Why? Why? Because it was always about a people. It was always about a church. It was always about the gathering. 300 years after Jesus died, 10.4% of the known world was Christian without any mass communication and very little ability to travel except by foot or horseback or sometimes wagons or ships. You know, the, that's amazing, isn't it? And one out of every 200 believers, 300 years after the cross, had been martyred for the cause of Christ. You know what? There was no dispute in those days about the corporate church and how important it was. But we in America have bought into an ideology that is absolutely the most dangerous thing that I have seen in my lifetime that suddenly church is optional. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's not optional. And I can go straight through the scripture and shut you down with your weird theology if you're that self-centered. I've studied it. I believe it. I bought into it. And I have never in my life loved the church of Jesus Christ like I love it today. My soul says I got to get there. My soul says I got to get there. Oh, God, thank you that I got here this Sunday. Thank you, God. Oh, God, I can breathe again. Thank you, God, that I'm at church. Lord, thank you that I'm here. We're about to start worship. God, how good is that? Lord, I can't wait to get the word. I'm getting my Bible out and I'm getting my pen. I'm going to write down everything I can. Lord God, I'm just open to you. But Lord God, it feels so good because we're all together and this is your church. And my soul has a place finally that I can be fulfilled. Thank God. Then he goes straight from that to the heart. To the heart. We know it's a heart issue. It says, My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. My soul longs, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Now, where was he worshiping? Where? By this time, Probably these descendants of Korah may have been worshiping in the first temple. Or maybe this was from the time of Moses in his later years. I don't know. So it was one thing or another, but it was the same thing in different wrapping. It was first of all, a brazen altar where sins were remitted. Hallelujah. Whew, praise God. Thank you, Lord, for the church of Jesus Christ where I can walk into an environment where my sin is not welcome, but I am. And then there was a brazen laver. You know what the brazen laver was? That was the place where the priests washed before they went deeper into the presence. You know, the truth is we have de-emphasized washings. <coughs> Baptism is a washing. The Lord spoke to me about my little football team at Evangel Christian Academy, and he said this to me. He said, you have given a viable Christian witness to these children through the years, and it has been a blessing to them. But what you are giving in a Christian testimony to them regularly and a preaching session will not keep them when they are in their first week of humanities class at the university. When those professors try with everything that is within them to rip the very tenets of faith from their chest. So he said, I want you to teach them doctrine. So I went and got all of the guys. It's not this Bible. It's another one that's actually better than this as far as the binding and the margins. I love wide margins, but these have real wide margins, and it's a thicker Bible. It's... 
I went and got every football player on my team a big brown leather Bible like this and got their name put on it. And then I engaged a gentleman that's 10 years older than I am who is a uh, legendary missionary and teacher and apostle and prophet. He's, a, he's, he's amazing. Irvin Rutherford. And I hired him on my coaching staff. I said, I'm going to pay you a salary, Irvin. You're my spiritual coach. And I said, I want you to teach doctrine. So he went straight to Hebrews. And the list of elementary doctrines, which the church, by the way, is by and large totally not aware of. And we began to go through doctrine. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, when you begin to teach the doctrine of my church, I will bring them alive from the inside out. Now, if you could be at our chapel sessions at Evangel Christian Academy, you'd be amazed because the biggest guys in the room on the first note of worship are crashing the stage. They've come alive. When they worship at 7.05 every morning, it's real. They're rocking. They're worshiping. They're singing. They've got their hands up. And then they get on their faces before God. And I pray a fatherly prayer over them because many of them have never heard a dad pray and many of them don't even know who their dad is. Then for 20 minutes, we have doctrine. And they sit up as straight as they can in that chair. And I make sure they do because if they don't, I'm... And they sit up. I'm their head football coach, but you know what I really am? I'm just the head discipler. And now they have been in that word for a year. And if you go through their Bibles, it looks so, it's so marked up. It looks like a seasoned old Pentecostal preacher's Bible. It's marked up. There are diagrams. When you, when you turn to the book of Exodus, they have, at my instructions, they have drawn the wilderness tabernacle with every piece of furniture and written out beside what the purpose was. And then because they had never opened the Bible, many of them, do you realize that? Never opened the Bible. In fact, when, when I got up the very first day and I went, turn to the book of John and they went like this. And I said, no, 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 that's, me. that's my fault. My bad, my bad. Turn to page 1172. And so throughout their Bibles, it has go to 1172. And then you turn to 1172. Go back to 332. Go back to the, and that's the way we study the Bible and have for a year by page number because we have the same Bible. Well, you say, what are you talking about? You're off on a tangent. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact That we as the body of Christ have an opportunity to get things done corporately that we can never get done individually. And if you don't sell out to the body, then you are inherently selfish and narcissistic and God can't honor you. You have got to come out of your closet. Go there. Go there. Get a face-to-face revelation of God. You must always go there. But when you come out, wash your face, get a smile, and walk into the midst of the gathering of the church of Jesus Christ because that is what your soul should be crying out for. Well, man, I'm done. My dad loved the church of Jesus Christ. When my dad died, all three network stations in Shreveport, Louisiana ran him as the lead story two nights in a row. The first time that I saw one of the telecasts, it just broke me. Because this beautiful young black woman was doing the announcing. And I knew she didn't know my dad. She had probably been hired from another market. She was not a familiar face to me. 
but she stood there in reverence before our church and the church was in the background as she said this. She said, today a Shreveport legend died. A man who loved God and loved people. And then they ran a video special on my sweet dad. If you were to ask me, what distinguished a life like that? It's easy. He got it. He loved the Lord's sheep. He loved the Lord's lambs. He loved the church of Jesus Christ. He couldn't wait to get there. You know, we had three buildings that we met in. And here's what I want you to understand. No, we don't worship a building. But places where special stuff happens should be special places to us as human beings. The first church we had was in the middle of a place called Cedar Grove, which is actually the heart of the hood. Wonderful black pastor who I absolutely adored. He, he died a premature death, and I, and I miss him. But he was the kind of guy that would visit people in the neighborhood, and he always knew what was going on in Cedar Grove. Michael Brown, how I love sweet Michael Brown. One day, Michael and I were at a minister's meeting together. He came over and he said, do you know your dad comes by? I said, no. Hell yeah, your dad comes by. We had sold the church to them years before that. I said, well, what? He said, well, he said, well Denny comes in, always comes by my office, always asks permission. I always tell him, no, pastor, you don't have to have permission. You can go in the church. And said, he goes in the church and he just touches the pews. And he weeps and he worships. And he will go up behind the pulpit and he'll hold on and touch the pulpit and then he'll kneel at those altars. There were big pine, rough hewn altars that were in front of our church. And they were stained with thousands of sobbing sessions of seeking the Holy Ghost. So he'll go to the altar. So then he'll take out his handkerchief, wipe his eyes, and he always comes and thanks me and he brings me an offering. And he leaves. Oh, how my dad loved the church of Jesus Christ. How he loved it, how he longed to get there. It was never an option to him. I don't care if we're on vacation, he was going to find some place to go to church. He loved the church of Jesus Christ. Then we built another building. And this was one that he built with his hands along with his deacon board and those manly men who most of them could really handle a hammer and a saw. They built it. And even after we moved to the big, spacious new church, almost every day, you could find him walking in that church, the older one, hands lifted. Oh, God, you've been so good to us. Thank you for this place. Thank you, oh, God, for what you've done here. Thank you for the way you've moved here. Lord, oh, how he loved the church of Jesus Christ. My daughter-in-law, Sarah Duran. What a great preacher she is. Never forget us going to the old church one day. And she hurriedly rushed over to the platform, the front of the platform. And she said, it's right here, it is. It's right here. It's right here. 
I said, what's right there, baby girl? When I was nine years old, I stood here, right here. And it was right here that I accepted the call to preach the gospel. Folks, let me tell you. The skeptics and the scholars and the theologians have done their best to rip it from you. Even our own government has tried to keep it from you. To dictate that you can't come here anymore. To try to redefine the way you think about the gathering. But I'm telling you, if there is one key to the visitation of the Spirit of God in this generation, it is that we once again love this house. We must love this place. We must do everything we can to get here. We must be here with the people of God. I'm sorry, you may feel like his fair-haired child, but you are not. He loves everyone in this place. He loves those that are the losers and the winners this week. Those that have lost confidence in themselves and those that have gained a step. He loves those that have not been faithful and those that have never missed. He loves those that are gifted and those that are just trying to get through Thursday. He loves the weak lambs that are lagging and he loves the strong ones that are at the head of the flock. He loves his church and we've got to love it too. Stand with me please all over this place. You know, I've got notes. I, got, I, I didn't use them. <laughs> because there was an anointing here to get this said. And we needed to hear it. We needed to hear it. Now I'm going to prophetically make a call right now. And I want you to lift your hands just like this to receive. On this Wednesday night, as a voice for the Lord of the church, mm. I call you back from the north, the south, the east, and the west. I call you out of your stupor. I call you out of your blindness, and I call you out of your deception. I say to you, open up your eyes to the glory that is the gathering. That is the church of the living God. I say to you that you do not come through these doors because of what you need or because something is being given to you that you value. But you come because the Lord loves his people and you must love them too. And every time you love them, he records every conversation that you have not with yourself but with others prayers not for yourself but for others and as you intercede and stand between men and God he is pleased and as you love and give and you make up the hedge he is pleased And as you speak forth words of comfort and life and assurance and confidence, he is pleased. And as you wrap your arms around the orphans in your midst, around the fatherless teenagers, around the widow, he is pleased. And as you become the healing station for this city and this region He is pleased, but the Lord would say, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together 
and all the more, all the more do not forsake it. All the more gather. All the more show up. All the more value it. As you see the day of his coming approach. For there are those who have made it their habit to not come anymore. Lift your hands and say this, Lord God, God, I will love your church church. as I have never loved your church. I will love your church. I will love the gathering. Even when I'm at odds with somebody, my soul is going to want to get here so that I can make it right. Even if I don't agree with something, This is my gathering place. You gave it to me. This is my family. And I will long in my heart to get here. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to point out one more thing. And then we're going to have just a response. Is that okay with you, Pastor, if we do that? Um, It's interesting how this passage is worded. And it was only tonight that I actually came to the, um, the understanding of it. Let me see, let me find my passage again. But I wanna, I wanna end with this. If you have your Bibles, I want you just to turn back to Psalm 84. I want you to underline this or circle it. I've gotten so used to doing this with the boys. It's been so much fun to see these young men get into their leather-bound Bibles. Uh, Hallelujah. Let's turn instead to Psalm 94. Psalm 94. This is the scripture that you're familiar with, and I am as well, but for some reason I can't find it. Um, He that is planted in the house of the Lord, he that is planted in the house of the Lord shall thrive in the courts of our God. Now, when you first read that, aren't you kind of saying, isn't that the same thing? I mean, aren't you, really? Doesn't that sound like the same thing? He that is planted in the house of the Lord shall thrive in the courts of our God. Well, that's wonderful. That's good writing because you just find another way to say it, to not be redundant, but... Do you know that those two things are not the same things? This is what it's saying. He that is planted in the house of the Lord on the earth will prosper, be blessed, thrive in the heavenly courts of God. You want to please God? You want to bless Him? You get more committed to the church of Jesus Christ than you have ever been. And I promise you, it's going to happen. Here's what I want to know. I want to know if anybody here got that mm when you were hearing this word. And you went, that's my next level. Because if, 
If you did, I want you to come here and let me pray for you. Come on. If that was you, I want you to come here and let me pray for you. You said, I got it, Pastor. I, I got it. It was that, it was that, mm, that's my next level. That's my next level. That's it. That's what God's calling me to. I'm going to love these courts. I'm going to love this house. I'm going to love the Lord's church like I never have. You know, some of you businessmen, you've come here tonight because you're good men and you, you show up when it's absolutely necessary. But you know what? It's been a long time since you loved this place like you did when you first got saved. God's going to restore that to you. And the joy is going to be immeasurable. God's going to do amazing things in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands all over this place. I want you to pray this right out loud with me. You ready? Living God, living God. I'm, here I'm here because you can depend on me. I heard your word tonight. I believe it. Every word of it. I know how you love your church. I know how you love your people. I'm going to love them too. Here I am, Lord. I'm going to love them too. Like I've never loved them. Because I know how you love them. I thank you that you love me. But I know it's not about me. It's always about us. You even taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Lord, it was always about us. Not about us as individuals, but us corporately. And Lord, we are mighty. We are mighty together. We cannot be stopped. We are the steamrolling church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love as no one loves. We give as no one gives. We live as no one lives. We bless you. Hallelujah. Lift your hand and bless the Lord all over this place. Just begin to bless him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Oh, we bless you, God. Come on, give the Lord praise. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to take just a moment and give you an invitation to accept Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. If you've never done that, and you have no assurance in your heart that you're right with God, ready to meet God in eternity, I want you to consider a couple of things. The Bible tells us that all of us have sinned. All of us have come short of the glory of God. You know, it's the one thing we all have in common. We're all sinners. We all need a Savior. The scripture says that the price of our sin is separation from God. Now, God doesn't want us separated from Him. He wants to connect with us. It meant so much to Him that He sent His own Son, Jesus, to come to this earth and to die on the cross for our sins. He rose again, and now the Bible says if we place our faith in Christ, we can be forgiven. We can be made right with God, and we can have a brand new life here and now and an eternal life when this life is over. Again, if you have no assurance of that, you can. You simply need to place your faith in Jesus Christ. The scripture says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So God loves you and he's ready to save you. He's just waiting on you to call on him. Why don't we do that right now? Let's call on God together by praying a very simple prayer. Repeat the words of this prayer after me. Let those words come right from your heart. Let's pray. Dear God, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner. I know my sin separates me from you and I don't want that. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he died for me and rose again. And through faith in Jesus, I believe my life can change. So I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive all my sin, and change my life. Be Lord of my life. From this day forward, I don't live for me anymore or the world anymore. God, I want to live for you. Help me to do that. And God, I thank you right now, even as I pray, according to your promise, my sins are forgiven. I'm now right with God. I am saved. Thank you, God, for saving me. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. If you just prayed that prayer with us, we want to know about it. We want to celebrate with you. Uh, all you'll need to do is just text the word SAVED, S-A-V-E-D, to the number that's on your screen. Or uh, just go to the description below and you'll see a link that you can click there. And someone will connect with you and give you some next steps in your brand new faith in Jesus Christ. We're so excited that you've accepted Christ as your Savior and your Lord today. Congratulations and God bless you.